This week, we chat to Sean Shemmel, the voice of Goku from the Dragon Ball series. Johnny Robot takes a deep breath and heads into the new console release of Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate, while Jimmy the Geek gets into the seasonal spirit and guides us through his top five favourite video game Easter eggs. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week I'm not quite sure what the biggest story is. Is it the fact that The Last of Us is officially heading to PS4 later this year? The game is being developed in-house at Naughty Dog, and the studio is targeting a juicy 60fps and 1080p on the next-gen console. It's been given a shiny visual makeover and a bunch of performance enhancements, plus it's bundled up with all of the single and multiplayer DLC we've seen for the PS3 version so far. The Last of Us Remastered is landing in the US in summer 2014, so we don't have too long to wait. Maybe that's not the biggest story though. Maybe it's a bigger story that Epic Games has finally started talking about Fortnite. The brand new IP was revealed back in 2011, but the studio has been remarkably quiet until now, with the game gracing the cover of Game Informer. We're looking at four new classes at the moment, with more promised in time. The Constructor, the Ninja, the Commando and the Scavenger, each one acting pretty much like you'd expect, given their names. Epic has given us a couple of sneaky peeks at Fortnite over the past couple of years, so we're really excited that more is on the horizon. We're hoping for something big at E3. Something else huge, which may or may not be at E3, is a brand new one from Blizzard. The World of Warcraft developer recently registered a brand new trademark and it set tongues a wagon. Overwatch. It's a military term used when one vehicle or small unit takes a position where it can observe the terrain ahead as well as providing cover fire for other friendly units. It also happens to be the trademark that Blizzard has registered, hinting at something very different to StarCraft, Warcraft and Diablo. Obviously, we don't know anything about Overwatch just yet, but it is hoped that this is the game Mike Booth might be working on, bringing his expertise from both Left 4 Dead and Counter-Strike. This week was pretty good for proving rumours to be true. It was finally confirmed that yes, a new Borderlands game is in the works, even if it's not Borderlands 3. Instead, you can expect Borderlands the pre-sequel to hit PC, PS3 and Xbox 360 in the second half of the year. The game tells a little of Handsome Jack's backstory and it's currently in development at 2K Australia alongside Gearbox Software. Expect more of the same, a bazillion guns and all of the traditional shoot and loot gameplay, plus four new playable characters and a bunch of new weapon classes. And did we mention you're on the moon? It was also confirmed that yes, Bruce Lee will be a playable character in EA's upcoming UFC adaptation. He can be unlocked either by pre-ordering the game or by completing career mode on pro difficulty. The character, designed around body scans and candid photographs, is playable across four weight classes and brings his own special moves to the party. However, it wasn't all good news. Ubisoft has confirmed that the PC version of Watch Dogs will indeed use its proprietary Uplay DRM service when the game launches in May, even if you buy it on Steam or from another digital distributor. Predictably, gamers are now threatening boycotts. On the flip side though, Ubisoft has also shown off one of its newest projects set to launch in the second half of the year. The Crew was delayed at the same time as Watch Dogs late last year, but received much less attention. Now it seems it's the action driving game's time to shine. Pre-orders are available now with a couple of different bonuses offered at different retailers. Ask around to find the one you like the best. In other news, Bohemia Interactive has given gamers a week of ups and downs. Up! The Zeus DLC for Armour 3 is available right now, giving you the opportunity to take on the role of Game Master, toying with your friends' virtual lives. You will loom over the battlefield, changing everything at a whim. Use the real-time editor to spawn enemies, adjust the soundtrack, set new objectives, and even change the weather, all to help or hinder the poor fools below. 
At the same time, though, the studio has announced that it is ending support for the free version of Armour 2 this month following the closure of GameSpy's server systems. If you want to keep playing, you will have to fork out real-world money for a full version of the game, or perhaps upgrade to Armour 3 and all the DLC action that entails. Disney looks like it's getting ready to make good on its promise of new characters for Disney Infinity, with a teaser trailer making gamers and comic fans alike squeal with anticipation. And Sony has made a couple of big announcements too. First up, a free-to-play zombie-themed MMO for PS4 and PC named H1Z1. We're told that death is the only sure thing as you duke it out in a battle of extinction against both the infected and your fellow humans. The game is drawing inspiration from some of the other popular undead experiences floating around, promising to focus primarily on survival and crafting rather than just run and gun. We don't know too much about it yet, but we are promised that we will be playing it soon, hinting that a beta, at least, is in the works. Believe it or not, we're also hearing hints that we'll be seeing more from another elusive Sony franchise soon, with stories coming from Japan that developers working on The Last Guardian are getting ready to make a big announcement. It's been nearly five years since we first heard about the game from Team Eco, but apparently Sony is now biding its time, waiting for the best opportunity to re-announce the game, which may now be headed to PS4. We don't know when that opportunity will come up, but E3 sure sounds pretty comfy to us. For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, We've got plenty more still to come. For Oz Comic Con, I'm a guest. I am best known as the voice of Goku on Dragon Ball Z. Um, I was recently, last year, I was in the Dark Knight Rises for iPad. I played Batman and Bruce Wayne. I play Bronk and Orbital 7 and Yu-Gi-Oh's Exile currently. And he, you'd have to get through me first, and you know that won't happen. Fine, let's do this. <laughs> Good, because I'm sick of this talk. <laughs> For me, it was the first time, you know, you, you watch TV, watch TV, you have no control. You're controlling the TV. And so that's what the, so even with Pong, it was like, I'm moving something on the screen. It was really, really a, an intriguing thing. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a hardcore gamer. I used to be. Um, it's so funny. I remember I was, I was had a hard time finishing college because I was gaming so much. And I, I took all my, my PS1 and I took it to the gaming place. And I go, um, yeah, I, I got to get rid of all these games. I got I to get back to my studies. And, and he goes, he goes, once a gamer, always a gamer. You'll be back. Like, like I was like, he was some kind of drug pusher. He was right. <laughs> I was back. I was like, I want more drugs. Uh, you know, more video game drugs. Nice little jab there. But who said you were done? Believe me, drowning is the least of your worries! I recommend the Americans bring Australian toilets to America. <laughs> because they will just pummel anything in the toilet. You got an American toilet, it's like... <laughs> Australian toilet is like... That's not a toilet, this is a toilet. <laughs> Pummels it. It's just, I, I've always been a fan of... In fact, I haven't thought, I'm gonna try to find a business to import Australian toilets. Because they got the water saver feature, and they will just... There's no clogged toilet. It's just pummeling everything. It's my one of my favorite things about Australia is the toilet. Anyway, <laughs> what else? What else, else are we talking else about? Everybody else comes over and likes koalas and kangaroos. No, and screw the koalas. Toilets. I no, I like koalas and kangaroos. Uh, we did go to a, 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 a zoo in Perth behind the scenes. I got to touch an elephant. That was really cool. And an Australian native elephant, obviously. Yes, the Australian native Asian elephant. Uh, it was an Asian elephant, I believe, or an Indian or Asian elephant. I can't remember what. But it wasn't the giant ones, but it was a very big creature. Looked me right in the eye. For, it was kind of cool. It was really cool. It was a magical experience. And I'd been to the uh, kangaroo preserve in uh, Brisbane before, hanging out with the kangaroos. That was pretty cool. I felt bad about eating them later, but, you know, it was tasty. Yeah. Now, of course, if the Dragon Balls were being held somewhere in this vicinity, 
Then our chance to wish for eternal life just went up in smoke, now didn't it? All because you had to oh. say hello. So let's talk about the fact that you're in Dragon Ball Z. Yes, I am. And so there are a number of Dragon Ball Z video games. Yes, there are. Do you play them? I, I have played them. I don't play them as much as you would think because... Well, I, first of all, I kind of get sick of hearing my own voice, um, and I and I saw so play other characters because I like those characters better. Um, the other thing is, um, you wouldn't think by this interview that I'm sick of hearing my own voice, but um, <laughs> but um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm so used to Tekken and Virtua Fighter that the Dragon Ball Z controls they're they're very good games, but I was trying to work out the I'm like this is so much more complicated, um, and I think there are things I like about Dragon Ball that. Like, it'll go to these marks where it's like a really fast fighting scene and I want to control it and I can't. Um, and I know a lot of kids just love them as the Budokai games. And I think they're, like I said, I think they're really good games. I just have a hard time wrapping my head around the control scheme because I'm so used to Tekken. And, and, and I'm doing some of the Blaze Blue games and, and some of the other fighting games and, and Street Fighter as well, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of the other fighting games. I'm like, really, Tekken? I used to not be a Tekken fan. Tekken's probably... Tekken just is the mechanics are so well thought out. It's and what's really cool is is on a 3DS the buttons are are set up in a way that you realize some of those I can't push my I can go da, 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 like one two three like you know X Y A B and you like press it down release it go and go da, da, da. but on a 3DS you can sweep them mm -hmm. and it works. I didn't realize that I realized that one day and I'm like wow I can be sweeping like I can go two to top two to bottom with bra and then a move executes and it just brings Tekken to life. So I'm like so I play it mainly on. On the 3DS, I'll play Tekken mainly on the 3DS, which I love. What the? I, by the way, hey, by the way, two years ago when I was here in Australia, I had a brand new 3DS, not a 3DS XL, in a case with all my games. It was either stolen or lost. If you have it and it said Sun Goku as the name, the personality profile name, that was my 3DS. I don't want it back. Just enjoy it. about six hours ago. They think maybe an escape attempt went bad. How many hostages? The entire prison staff. Batman. They're all in there. From petty thieves to the worst of the worst. The Dark Knight. The Caped Crusader. The world's greatest detective. Whatever you know him as, Batman is arguably the king of crime fighters and possibly the most recognizable, emotionally scarred masked millionaire in pop culture. In 2009, Rocksteady Games released Arkham Asylum, and a franchise was born. For the first time in ever, you actually felt like the Batman in a fully realized world with classic villains and allies, and with an amazing script penned by the one and only Paul Dini. So any game bearing the name Arkham from then on had a lot to live up to. That's right, Arkham Origins. And the latest 2D foray into the franchise, Arkham Origins Blackgate, seems to have dropped the ball. Repeatedly. So the plot. What's the nicest way to put this? It's far, 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 far from being an Eisner winner, or even marginally original. Guess what? Blackgate Prison's been overrun by the inmates, like every other second weekend, and the facility has been somewhat arbitrarily divided up into three zones. One by Backmask, one by Penguin, and one for the Joker, who for some reason isn't in Arkham Asylum and whatever. Batman's called in to go set things straight, but there's a clandestine group pulling the strings and yada, 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 whatever. Just go in there and bust some skulls and basically be the Batman. But the thing is, when you're playing Blackgate, you rarely feel like the Bat at all. All the intricacies we've come to expect from the Arkham series just don't translate into a 2D facsimile of Gotham. Instead of having the freedom of a 3D world in which to stalk people that spit in the face of justice and plan awesome ways to make them defecate themselves to the nth degree while informing them, you are the knight, and then promptly crippling them, you kind of just stumble around looking for people to exclaim, oh, over there before politely organizing a weak attempt at a brawl where they take turns to punch at you. 
Sure, there's still that free-flowing combat with all its counters and kicks that propel the bat halfway across the screen, but it feels unresponsive now, and sometimes just straight up doesn't work. There were never really any points where I felt that just spamming the attack button wouldn't see me through a conflict, unless the game demanded that I actually give active interest. And then after maybe hitting one other button, I don't know, to do some sort of ba fancy bat flip or something, my thumbs refound the slap button immediately, and we had a one-way ticket back to Spam City. Sad thing is, these mundane slap fests are a rather nice respite from the boring and uninspired platforming that takes up the rest of the game. Since you're essentially locked in the second dimension, holding right, or sometimes left when they want to flip the script on you, gets you to the end of a level with relatively little fuss. The fuss, however, comes in the form of having to use detective mode to scan every inch of the screen. You can't just run through it. I get it, he's the world's greatest detective, which means he should extrapolate red barrels with flame symbols on them, mean explode, without me having to scan it for three seconds. Having to do this all the time is just tedious and frustrating and grinds any momentum the game picks up to an abrupt halt. At points there seems to be hints of a Metroidvania feel, but the level designs just don't make you want to spend any more time than you have to navigating them, and straying off the intended path leads to no rewards more than a dead end. That's if you can actually tell that you've hit a dead end though since the game is so damn dark and plagued by muddy textures. Sure, I understand, this is the port of a handheld game, but Jesus, this is on the PS3. The PS3! The models are so laughably low res, the animation during fights are less convincing than a film student's first attempt at a kung fu movie, and the world's just boring and bland and repetitive and I don't even want to look at it. Regardless of the lackluster gameplay and meh visuals, Arkham Origins Blackgate fails on the most fundamental level of a Batman game. I want to feel like Batman. Okay, maybe not the deep emotional issues he harbors, but being a strategic badass that strikes fear into the heart of wrongdoers. It's not the genre perspective that stops this game from achieving this, because Batman on the NES did it 20 years ago. It's because it comes off as a quick and sloppy port that feels like nothing more than a release to keep the waning attention on the Arkham series for when Rocksteady pumps out another one next year. Just throwing this out there, Warner Brothers, Batman's looking really kinda tired. Would it kill you to let him sleep for a couple of months? You have other superhero franchises, you know. Let's talk about Easter eggs. Not necessarily the chocolate variety, or the standard sugar-coated ones, or even the traditional dyed hard-boiled type, but rather the little secrets that developers hide into their projects since time immemorial. Today, I'd like to share my favorite Easter eggs with you, so that you might go and find them in some of the most popular video games. Number 5. I invite you to remember a time where exploration was rewarded in games, a time before game facts. A time of Nintendo power. Chris Woolahan, a young gamer, entered a contest in 1990 that was hosted by Nintendo Power. The contest asked for a photo of Final Fantasy's War Mech boss, which was notoriously difficult to encounter. His reward was to be immortalized in gaming history. The Chris Woolahan room is designed to prevent Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past from crashing. The Super Nintendo game didn't know where to put you, it put you in that room. It's not all up to chance though, there are several methods of breaking the game and accessing the room, which contain 225 rupees and a message from the lucky guy himself. Number 4. According to Ron Gilbert, punishing the player for exploring the game by creating unwinnable situations or unexpected deaths is unfair and a bad game design principle. This is where we get the fabled LucasArts rule, meaning that no matter what type of situation you're in, there is always a way out. With that in mind, and the lengths you had to go to to perform this next egg, it's safe to assume that Drowning Guybrush in The Secret of Monkey Island is meant to be some kind of joke. As our mighty pirate can hold his breath for 10 minutes, and you're at one point underwater, all you have to do is wait for 10 minutes, at which point Guybrush is morphed into a soggy corpse. Hmm, that guy probably couldn't hold his breath underwater for very long. Too bad. Killing Guybrush became a running joke in the series, with a way to kill him in each of the first four games, and in the third, it became a major plot point. Number 3. Survival horror is by its very nature unsettling. 
The entire point of these games is to create a sense of tension and unease. At the end of a good horror game, the tension is released, and the player is given closure, or at the very least, a satisfying conclusion. On the other hand, Silent Hill 2. After completing the game three times, and finding a special key, the infamous dog ending is unlocked. Said ending contains a Shibuya Inu, now referred affectionately by the internet as a dog, named Mira is shown pulling levers, implying control over the entire city, and all of the events thus far. While the ending isn't officially canon, it certainly explains a lot, doesn't it? Number 2. Games developers would like you to remember your roots. A common trick with a lot of sequels was to embed the original in some kind of playable form. Access through a specific action. However, in 1997, Rare blew all previous efforts out of the water. Embedded in the code for the monster hit GoldenEye 007 for the Nintendo 64 was a fully functioning ZX Spectrum emulator with 10 games. The secret, which remained hidden for years, was supposedly to test whether or not the N64 could handle it. Games included the classic Saberwolf, Gunfright, and Jetpack, all of which were developed by Ultimate Play the Game, a studio which, you guessed it, became rare. As there is no way within the game itself to access this, the best way to see it is, somewhat ironically, on an emulator. Number one. One of the greatest things about video games is how they interact with the fourth wall, the separation between the player and the game. Every now and again a game comes along that reminds you of that distinction, with a wink to the camera or a hero berating you for playing wrong. One game, however, took it to the next level, and it was creepy as hell. Psychomantis, the boss character from Metal Gear Solid, claimed to be psychic and then showed you that he actually was by telling you what games you'd been playing lately. You like Castlevania, don't you? He then proceeded to beat you down by knowing every move you made. The terrifying trick was pulled off by reading your memory cards and controller inputs, and the only way to beat him was to, and this is serious, change controller ports. The game made every effort to completely destroy the fourth wall and create an unrivaled sense of immersion. And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, we visit Yoshi's New Island to see just how new this 3DS outing really is. Johnny Robot gets all comic book nerdy with Nicola Scott, the Australian artist currently retelling DC history in Earth 2. And I sit down with Anthony Birch to explore the mind behind Borderlands 2. In the meantime, you can catch us on playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.